AI is changing the whole world and changing the whole business environment. I will tell you a story and you guys like stories especially on an evening at uh, 6.30 p.m. I think uh, it will be interesting stories. Yeah. AI is impacting business so much that the traditional common sense thinking doesn't hold anymore and I will tell you a story for that. Let us say we are in 1995 and I am asking you to predict what is going to happen in 2010 and I will give you examples of two different products and I will ask you which product in the year 1995 you would predict that by 2010 is going to be spectacularly successful and then of course 2010 is already in the past but we will figure out what really happened. So, this is a two products one pro both are encyclopedias in 1995 Microsoft announced that they are going to create a spectacular encyclopedia which is going to be on a CD there is going to be lots of images pictures audio Bill Gates actually is putting his own credibility on the line Microsoft is a for profit company so they actually wants to make profits out of this product they hired intelligent hard working managers who will be managing the whole effort who are paid and had bonuses they hired writers who are, who have strong credentials so this they evaluated the credentials and then hired the right people to write information for uh, uh, the encyclopedia which they called the encarta and bill gates said it's going to be a super successful product where you will put it on your desktop and maybe a laptop this cd is going to give you give you an insight into the whole world with this information okay that's product number 1 a few years later not even in 1995 a few years later a completely unknown company said that okay we want to create some sort of an encyclopedia we don't care who's going to be writing we're not going to check the credentials of the people you can write whatever you want to you can write whatever topics you want to it they went through multiple changes but eventually if you look at a macro scale at, at, at a high level there was no quality assurance control on the writers eventually yeah, but they tried that originally they tried that originally but even later on to even today i think they said okay some of the offensive language information and completely wrong information we're going to take out by having paid people but predominantly i think you can actually have anyone writing it and there are no supervisors and there's no project managers there's no incentive the company is not looking for profits and if you are given if you are an economist or if you are a product manager if you are the CEO of a company if you are the technologist and if you are asked to predict which product is going to be super successful in 15 years from now that is from 1995 to 2010 you would predict you would pick what uh, uh, Encarta was I think a natural uh, uh, idea so that it is going to be successful but it was not the case uh, actually in 2009 I believe Bill Gates announced that okay they are going to come out of uh, the uh, encyclopedia business because it is not making money but even today there are more than, more than 3 million articles written on, on, on so many different topics and on so many different languages um, and the second one I was talking about is Wikipedia you, you already know that. So. so, the common sense business ideas what we hold important today may not be valid going forward especially in the context of AI and I am sure you already heard of uh, uh, another business model which came around 10 years ago where uh, the two young I think Vietnamese slash Chinese born smart guys they were starting a company and they reached out to this venture capitalist and said oh we are going to start a company we are going to make it easy for people to upload the videos but we do not want to make it expensive we are not going, to, not going to charge anything for these people but we need we need hundreds of millions of dollars because we need heavy infrastructure and if you were to be the VCs for those companies you would have never invested in that company because they do not have a clue about how they are going to make money but they want to invest a lot of money I am talking about YouTube. I am into AI for some time now and, and I feel there is a tremendous amount of change that is coming in and I am going to talk about today uh, um, recommendation engines uh, how companies are trying to bring you the right information in the fastest way but I think the right information in the sense relevant contextually relevant and useful information of course they are going to make more money in the process but I think the objective as a technology people my, my ambition is also to see how do I write a, a spectacular recommendation engine that actually makes it easy for a person to find the information what you are looking for. I am going to show a few examples uh, today just to 
drive home the point of the diversity of the problems and the diversity of the solution approaches. And I am going to talk about fo more focus on the deep learning techniques being used in the last let us say 12 to 18 months. Um, four or five years ago I think there were machine learning techniques used and I will talk about one as an example just to set the ground for the recommendation engines, but I will in the slides I am going to talk about um, the, the four famous four or five uh, recommendation engines. There are lots and lots of recommendation engines available depending upon the business case you have whether it is an e-commerce company or a product company or a video company or a news company uh, your solution is going to be different and, and I am going to talk about some of the problems in the process and of course you can ask me any questions you want. Um, one of the earliest recommendation engine I think I remember myself be living in the Bay Area is um, a company called Pandora. Uh, it is a music uh, company and uh, it is actually sponsored by the government of the uh, uh, United States federal government. They had sponsored um, it is called uh, I think it is called in the Department of Defense I think they had a music project I guess and uh, the, the person was working actually was um, uh, a, a scientist with a bunch of patents they came out with this unique idea on how do I identify what songs you like and what songs you like and of course even based on the mood and the time of the day the, the likes are going to be different but still assuming that you have one likes all the time but how do I know which songs you like without asking too many questions. So they came out of this idea I remember uh, I was working for Apple and then the CEO of the company had come to give a speech in, in, the, in, the, in the company on explaining what the model is and if you, even today if you go to Time Magazine they have written the complete algorithm and how it works. But this is almost like a pre machine learning solution. They said we are going to actually identify the unique features every song has and we are going to give a score for each of the unique feature for that song. Let us say oh uh, it is a fast song or a, or a dance song or a, or a melodious or a female singer. So, you can think about features about that may uniquely identify a song. How many features you think it makes sense to uniquely identify a song? What do you think? How many feature features? 5, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40? Well, let us say genre is one of the let us say genre is one feature then once you get into the genre what would be more features will. So, how many such features you can pick to uniquely identify a song? 20 to 25, 20 to 25 okay. They came out with 400. 400 features and they gave a score between 0 and 10 with an increments of half. So, every song which actually is a 4 minute song 3 and a half minute song it takes 20 minutes to score a song. And this is done manually. The feature engineering was done manually, and there were around 20 to 30 song experts the company used to hire every time they hire new people. They had to go through some training because of normalization and regularization. These are the two terms you got to remember, I think, in machine learning. Um, anytime you do uh, any machine learning solution, I think you got to figure out okay, how do I normalize it, how do I regularize it, make sure it is general enough, uh, generic enough, uh, not overfitting and stuff. They give a score of uh, either 1 or 2 or 1.5 or 2 whatever is score for those each of the 400 uh, features. So, now you convert the song into a vector of 400 dimensions and after that it was a pure statistical technique of measuring the distance the L1 L2 distances or cosine similarity whatever I think they have there are a bunch of techniques available just to find out how close a vector is to the other vector. For example, if you have been doing um, any NLP like word embeddings you actually can measure uh, you, sh you, should, you should if you are not done it I think you should check that when you do uh, a word embeddings and you do you translate that into a two dimensional uh, uh, in a two dimensional space using T S N E T S N E you actually can see each of the word as a small dot on the two dimensional space and you will see words of similar nature they come together all the words which reflect the months they are together all the words that reflect the names of the capitals of the world they come closer in the in the geography. So, it now becomes a statistical activity and no more a, a, a pure artistic activity and the company was proud to say that all that we want is the first 10 songs you do a thumbs up or a thumbs down and we would figure out what you need what you like 
and after that we will start making recommendations for you and they were I think decently successful. Of course, there were some other factors why the company became very successful. One of the first companies which had the highest or the largest collection of songs. I think 140 million songs. I think even today they may be the one of the largest one. Um, uh, Spotify may be popular for some other reason, but I think they don't have as much collections as Pandora. And and they were the first company which actually revolutionized the whole music industry and then got Congress to make a couple of legislations. Anyway, I'm digressing. That was the non-machine learning solution for a recommendation in music industry. But I'm going to talk about uh, machine learning based. And I will talk about first some ML based solutions and then I will talk about the deep learning solutions. Uh, only one slide for ML, but I will talk about the DL rest of the slides. Every time you talk about recommendation engine, you want to find out what are the items you are selling or you are offering and who are the users. The two most common fundamental recommendation engines or the techniques used for recommendations engines are content based and collaborative filtering. Content based is let us say if I pick an example as a movie, you look into various aspects of the movie or even the song for example, it is a violent action, uh, name of the actors or whatever is the features you look for. You look for various features in the of the item it is called the latent factors or just the factors or the features of the of the item that is called content based. It could be the user or it could be the item and when you do enough analysis you know product A, product B, product 3 are very similar to each other and user 1 has bought product A. So, it is a higher chance that the he may he or she may prefer product B and product C and then you may make a recommendation that is called content based. Collaborative filtering which is actually a lot more popular and a lot more effective is it looks at the user and item interactions. If there are 10 users and they interact with 10 other items based on your interaction does not matter what your basic features are or the features of the item just based on the interactions you can find out you can make start recommendations. For example, you see there is a, a, a box there at the top. Uh, this is actually a matrix of users on the items. You get the feedback from the users and there are two types of feedback. One is explicit feedback. So, when you buy an Amazon book it asks, asks you or when you watch a movie it asks you oh, did you like it and you say yes or no or you give a score. That is an explicit feedback. Normally in the world today uh, the, the matrix of the user on the item for explicit feedback is very, very sparse. Even for you guys when you watch a Netflix movie or when you download or buy a book from Amazon, how many times you would have given a feedback on the book or the movie etc. It is hardly, it is not even 0.001 percent. So, it is very, very sparse matrix. Early recommendation engines were focusing on the explicit feedback, but off late it is all implicit feedback in terms of even they do not even want you giving a feedback. If you give it that is fine, but we want to find out the implicit feedback. Sometimes it is more effective. Uh, let us say you bought a book that means you actually liked it even if you do not tell us that you like the book you bought a book. Now, you may say oh I bought it to give it as a gift to someone or I was forced to buy the book because of reason A B C or the book was free and hence I bought it. Some of these reasons could be considered as noise, but on a, on a macro scale the implicit feedback is lot more valuable for companies in making recommendation engines. So, even though you can actually have by the way if it is any AI you cannot have I can never make a presentation on AI without mathematics and um, I know I will try to talk without mathematics, but it is not really the core AI guy in me gets you know beats me up in the night so now you cannot do that. So, I will try to not talk about too much of mathematics, but you got to. So, let us say there are m users and n items and if then you actually have a m by n matrix which is r the capital r is the matrix if you look at the 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 feedback matrix it's because it's extremely sparse you can make you can actually predict what would be these missing ratings 
by actually factorizing that matrix it is called matrix factorization. So, the earliest technique in, in, in recommendation engine is called matrix factorization. So, if you have a matrix of R of m by n size and R i j is the feedback rating given by ith user for jth item R i j can be missing or can be present. So, in other words it is observed or it is not observed that is it is there or it is not there if it is given by the by the by the user yes it is good if not you can actually go for implicit feedback. Just based on this data you actually can factorize the matrix R into two matrices like u and v in such a way that u times v can be used to almost reconstruct R and then u becomes the matrix that reflects that focuses on the users and the v as a matrix focuses on the items and when you when you run machine learning techniques like let us say uh, a single value single value decomposition SVD you can actually start learning some latent factors which was not even mentioned in the first place. For example, if it is a movie which is an item in this case and when you see user 1, 5, 25 all liked the same movie, but uh, same people liked at in a different context movie with the same uh, not a movie let us say a book written by the same person who acted in the same movie I am just making it up. When you do the SVD or a similar ML techniques some of the latent factors get extracted in the process you had a question. Uh, I have not heard of it. The answer is no. It, I don't think they exist. But I'm not a hundred percent mathematician, so I, I would not, I would not know. But in practical world, if you look into an m by n matrix of R, that is m times n is the number of cells in it. Maybe zero point zero 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 one percentage of those cells will be filled. That is if you have a million feedback maybe a hundred maybe 500 maybe a thousand items are, are, are with feedback explicit feedback. But if it is an implicit feedback you actually can get a lot more feedback because you actually can compute based on certain actions by the user. For example, if you are watching a video if it is a 30 minute video let us say you start the video and immediately stop within one, one second or stopped after one minute after 15 minutes after 30 minutes after the whole video. You can actually say right now because of the all the mathematics they take only binary uh, answer. If you watch the video that means you like it, if you not watch the video you do not like it and so there is 1 or 0 the duration does not matter they actually have threshold. Okay, 5 minutes is means you watched or less than 5 minutes means you actually did not watch you maybe you clicked accidentally and it went there for 5 minutes and then you did not watch and hence it is not. But if your question is how much data should be there. Um, How much data is required to be valid? No, so the quality and quantity, it is a, a fine line. To I have not heard of the quantity wise because I think people, the entire focus of this exercise is if with the available, this with the sparse data available, I think maybe you want to hold on to this question and maybe ask towards the end too because I think one of the uh, solution I talk about is called auto encoder. Un auto encoder is a, a deep learning technique which will recreate the data you are giving. So, where the input data is missing, corrupted, erroneous, it recreates the original data, but now this is a better data, it is the same data. Those techniques are being used predominantly and, and a, a variations of a variety of variations of those techniques are being used to enhance the data, the missing data. So, the quantity wise I think there is no minimum limit on what the quantity is. Quality is another problem because that is why initially the explicit feedback was not sufficient. Now, you are trying to take a implicit feedback, but implicit feedback has lots of noise goes back to the quality aspect. Autoencoders to some extent address that 
the noisy feedback because one of the basic features of auto encoder if you guys have not have read about that you should read about that what, what is an auto encoder that is one of the fundamental activity it does it actually takes an existing data runs to the neural network and outputs the same data but it is lot more better quality than, than the first one and, and then you can use variations of auto encoders to actually create better code uh, better uh, data I am going to show, show that too you had a comment too. Well, I, I, I might have some insight into sort of what's going on and sort of what you think about the sort of the, the amount, minimum amount of data. Um, and so when I think of these systems, I don't think of a two-dimensional matrix. Um, I think of individual um, hidden sort of embed, embedding vectors, and the model is simply taking the dot product between two embedding vectors. Mm -hmm. And so you think of each one of these user ratings as like an equation uh, where the embedding vector numbers are uh, the variables in that equation that you're trying to solve for, uh -huh. and and the statement is just the number of equation. So you think of like in, in high school algebra, where they say, you know, you need the same number of equations as you have unknowns in order to sufficiently solve that, that mm -hmm. set of equations. And so I'm going to use that as kind of a rule of thumb for the minimum set. And so it has a lot of variables, like for example, the number of dimensions in your u and v vector. Um, can affect the amount of data that you need uh, in order to quality sort of solve for all of those hidden variables. Yeah, you, you made a bunch of comments and then you actually are an advanced guy, I think, yeah. about topics I'm going to talk about. The vector embeddings of, let's say, the user and the items, that would be the state you have to reach before you start making recommendations. That I'm going to talk about that vector embeddings, how to arrive at that, and the dot product inner dot product inner dot product of these vectors to arrive at certain values and you do a back propagation and then you do a sigma uh, uh, a softmax uh, uh, classification and then do a back propagation and see if you can actually constantly up update the the, uh, the vector embeddings itself but not to get too much technical you have the raw data raw input data you're getting either explicit or implicit and you convert that into some sort of vector embeddings of the user and the items and then do a bunch of ML and the DL activities on it to actually arrive at better quality data. And when I say data, I am actually talking about two different things. A recommendation engine can do two different things. One is it can actually predict the missing ratings of a user item combination. Let us say you have you want to make a recommendation to this user and you have seen his or her ratings in a few instances but you want to see whether the user likes this or not because this item seems to be popular and other people are taking it so i want to find out whether this user likes it or not so all that i have to do is predict the rating for that user and for that item the i and j that is one type of recommendation. Second type of recommendation is you will just say okay, we think this product or this item will be useful to you and that is based on a bunch of factors. Some of the solutions I am going to talk about today is just to talk about how to predict the ratings of the u and i, the i and i and j, the, the user and the item, um, but some other solutions actually talks about the, the final recommendations itself. Earliest models, maybe I think a year, a year and a half ago. When I say year, a year and a half ago, I want you to, you guys, to appreciate the fact that the technology is really, really evolving today. All of us are in that time frame. When you have your kids, maybe twenty years from now, they would not even know that this type was never existing. Uh, what they would see from from uh, twenty years from now. Things are changing almost on a monthly basis. You see papers being published on another newer techniques. For example, I will give you the paper published on YouTube, how YouTube make recommendations to you when you go to their site about what would be the right videos you got to watch. I will talk about what was the earliest recommendation engine they had and what is the latest one they have. And when I say latest, I am talking about 2016. And now they are working on a newer recommendation engine which they are not published yet. So, obviously I cannot, I do not know what, the, what it is, but they are working on it. 
so those early models were focusing on purely the user level information and the item level information but then later on came something called side information what can be the additional information i can bring in in other words the content based recommendation engines and the collaborative filtering models there is something called hybrid models where you actually can use both you actually can use the collaborative filtering and certain aspects of content based in this case you get the content information so you have additional information of x and y in this case i was talking about u and v but in this case x and y x can be the additional side information of the user and y can be the additional side information of the product which is actually more of a content based model approaches but that is being used in combination with cf collaborative filtering and then making a prediction so if you have the matrix r you have the matrix x and y about the user and the item and if you compute the latent factors of the user the the goal is to learn the latent factors of the user and the item u and v using this loss function i won't explain the loss function but the the loss function is also explained there um for an explicit feedback the the for the specific user and the item what the rating is and the dot product of the user embeddings and the item embeddings if you do uh, if you if you do a subtraction and then uh, 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 summation of it product summation of it you would you would get that's a loss function for explicit feedback and similarly you can have implicit feedback too um in the in the implicit feedback you actually have the rating predicted so the predicted rating and there is another factor called the confidence factor how confident are you about these ratings um that's some of the basics i want to talk about and of course this is some uh i do have at the end at the bottom of every slide i have uh the link to the paper i picked up this information from um you can take a picture or you can write it down and you can read more of the information there's a the recommendations being done in so many different areas google play the app app site for google google they came out of this uh, model i think in 2016 uh, june july um uh, archive.org is a good site uh, you can go check for the papers uh, and the numbering the the naming convention is this is the year and this is the month of publication of the paper the earlier mo recommendation model they were using let me step back in this case they are using something called a wide and a deep model together earlier they were doing only the wide model and I, let me explain what a wide model is and a deep model also and then they connected together a wide model is where you are looking at a linear correlation between various uh, uh, items or users a wide model actually also does some sort of a memorization that is if two items coexisted co co occur constantly model will actually memorize that correlation and when you see one product being bought by one user it automatically recommends this, the second product also by the way going back to your uh, earlier question I, i was about to tell you the minimum amount of data it can be zero too that's called cold start when companies when a new company comes in they don't have any data they don't have any feedback or let's say you introduce a new product you're using a new book or a new song etc you don't have any data so that's a cold start and you can actually do a few things about even amazon if you say if you if you log in for the first time it picks up the popular books and recommends you because they don't have anything any information about you and then that could be one way of tech one way of solving the cold start issues there's so many other techniques too but i was about to tell you and then i was it must in your response and i forgot about so it can be it's called cold start this if you don't have any data at all so it can be theoretically zero and then you can still have recommendation engine but then that recommendation is not really a, a custom recommendation it's more of a, a popular recommendation oh po people have bought this do you want to look at this too without doing anything with the person in a wide model which actually memorizes it because if two items co occur constantly model memorizes that and then start recommending it to you 
But the problem with that is when you introduce a new product, when you have a cold start, it will not be able to make a recommendation of a product which is has is never seen. And hence, if you are a company selling a diverse type of products, let us say music and apparel or books, if it has got information about music using a wide model, it only can recommend maybe other music, uh, uh, other songs, but not something else. But the problem in that situation is let us say, yeah, you, you like song number one and there is a similar song which it, you can, it can recommend. But let us say you bought a refrigerator today, you would not buy another refrigerator for the next few years. So, that would not work, the, the wide model does not work. Deep model is actually you, you use a neural network to study the latent factors of the users and the latent factors of the items and using a softmax, maybe it is called classification uh, entropy loss, you do a, a, a train a model and it can recommend transitive relationships too. Let's say for example, a relationship between a book and a song or a car and a refrigerator or whatever. You, if you have a, a variety of products, you can do the transitive connections of, of, of products. So, what they have done is they found the user features and the item features can be put into two different categories. One is categorical information. What is a categorical information? A user can be a male or a female. So, 1 and 2 or A and B whatever. Certain other type of features can be continuous. The age for example, someone can be age 25, 26, 27, 30, 35 whatever it is. It is a continuous number. They looked at the continuous features and the categorical features. For categorical features, they converted them into embeddings and the continuous features were given unique IDs and what they have done is, this is extremely mind boggling, they just concatenated all of these vectors into a single vector. Actually, it is a end to end concatenation, not top to bottom concatenation, but end to end concatenation. So, they actually have one single vector of 1200 dimensions going into the network and they actually had three layer network and they, they while training, they was doing a logistic loss and then trying to make a prediction of what it is. Uh, here is an example of uh, area under, under curve, uh, how it is performing, let us say just the only wide alone, deep alone and wide and deep, uh, uh, how the model became more popular. In this case, they were actually, ha the, the, the situation they had was, uh, they had a billion active users at any point of time and there were almost 1 million apps at the time of publication of this paper, they have 1 million apps. If they had to not use this model and still make a uh, recommendation, they will have to correlate between 1 million apps with another 1 million map, uh, apps that is million times million correlations need to be done and that of course, is not humanly possible. Um, here there was some amount of human feature engineering done uh, because when, when, you, when you log in for the first time at, at, at the app site the model actually creates a query and what apps to pick that is instead of having all the million apps to be exposed to you, they it the model actually shortlists a few and that is done by human query and those maybe I think 100 I think they pick 100 or 200 I think they pick and then they do a recommendation engine on top which actually does more of ranking. So, candidate generation is of a lesser focus here but ranking was more of an issue in this case. Uh, if you want to read the paper, I think it, you can you can just understand the paper more if you read that. Now, app. Let me let me give a couple of uh, scenarios in app. If you bought a fitness app, the probability of you buying another fitness app is quite low. But the probability of you buying a music app is higher because yeah, when you go for a workout, maybe you want to listen to. So, you have to figure out what is related, but if you ask, if you go just by the memorization that is a wide model approach, it will recommend you another music app <coughs> which was not useful. Now, that is about, that's about the apps. Let us talk about news. This actually is a paper published 
by Yahoo News for Japan especially markets. When you log into your Yahoo News in Japan, this is how you have the, the on the right side is, is your smart screen, smartphone screen. You have the basic header at the top and then these are some of the top popular topics for everyone. It's, this is not personalized. Here is a personalized information about based on what <coughs> the model thinks will be useful for you. In this case, they found they actually wrote a paper I think in 2015, but again in 2017 uh, it is a famous conference called KDD. I do not know what it expands to, but it is a conference and the, this was pu published there. It actually was improvised version of the previous model. They found a few problems in news recommendation. One is of course, it has to be customized. Second is the <coughs> popularity of a news that is what is popular today you, you, you have to show the model has to show news that is relevant today that is very very time sensitive. So, what they do is every 24 hours they throw away all the articles they have and then look at the tens of tens of thousands of articles they get on, on, a, on a daily basis to see if they can run the model on it and then recommend uh, the users. Here, Yeah, that is called topic modeling. <coughs> See, if you look into natural language processing, <coughs> sorry, <I don't> know. <coughs> natural language processing, there are a bunch of areas of study called question answering, uh, you have summarization, there is something called topic modeling too. So, you can give a bunch of topic, uh, a text, it actually can identify which topic this falls into. So, if the user has given explicit feedback, oh, I log politics, and then you can pick all the politics things. See, the problem with that is unless the user has given very explicitly, I want Japanese politics, it could politics could be anything, especially if you are a multi, multinational newspaper, you want to have wider audience, you will be getting real credible news from other parts of the world too, political information and then you do not know how much to show, that is number one. Time sensitivity, so sometimes you do, you, if something is an old uh, article, you do not want to show that. Number three, here is the uh, uh, problem, most problematic thing. Let us say a major event is happening, uh, uh, a newsworthy event is happening, but different news organizations are reporting the same news. You would write it differently, they may be the same information. So, the model has to figure out if this is 90 percent the same, then you should discard all of those things because then the user has already seen it. But what if it is an evolving story? Let us say there is an accident that happened or a terror attack happen and every hour you have new information coming in. So, there you may still have 90 percent maybe 70 percent information same, but the other information is not and hence you got to <coughs> there I think you have to run models differently, but here what they have done is on the article level they want to find out which one is similar, which one is not similar. So, they picked triplicate that is they picked three models while training enough uh, of uh, water uh, yeah thank you I will appreciate that yeah. They because it, it happens every 24 hours the triplets of article analysis to find out which articles are more similar and hence discarded which articles are relevant and to be kept. That can be done even before a few minutes before or maybe a few hours before the uh, uh, the user logs into the system. The way they do is they actually use an auto encoder I mentioned to you earlier. Let me take a sec. Auto encoder is nothing else but a minimum three layer neural network. It has an input layer, it has an output layer and at least one middle layer. The neural network the input comes in gets uh, transformed into a, a sort of a hidden state another vector called hidden state and that hidden state is further transformed into an output because it is not an encoder you are actually recreating. So, your recreation loss has to be minimum for the output compared to the input that is the whole logic of auto encoder. So, if you input article x 1, x 0 and x 2, x 1 
uh, x0 is your base article and you one you pick an article which is very similar and another article which is from a different category not the same not similar you put all of these article through an auto encoder when i say put an article through an encoder what does it mean using an lp you just put the text word by word and sentence by sentence into an auto encoder and convert the entire article into a hidden state of the encoder and just looking at the hidden states of that is the hidden state of x1 is h1 x0 is h0 see so the hidden state the dot product of h0 and h1 if it's tremendously more than the uh, dot product of h0 and h2 then you know these two are similar and these two are not similar these are these two are dissimilar and then that is how you actually constantly churn articles and keep ready what may be relevant to the user that is all the at the article level. When it comes to the user another problem in your news recommendation is even though you like political news but there is a terrorist activity going on and you want to read about that or this is a Oscar uh, 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 announcements or Nobel Prize winners are being announced you want to focus on that. So, instead of looking at the user behavior as a set in this paper they took user behavior as a sequence. For example, your last most recent behavior is important, but more important than the pre the, 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 the let us say hour ago of one day ago or two days ago behavior which is different from the previous example. Here if user has liked if the same as the case in YouTube too, if user has liked certain uh, uh, items in the, in the in the current session, but in the recent past, you can't only recommend all the time the music apps you just downloaded. Or in the YouTube situation, you cannot only show all the videos you just liked. Let's say you was looking you were looking for uh, Tom Cruise movies, and uh, two days ago you were watching I do not know give me the names of some actors let us say actor A and actor B, but you have not looked at actor B, A and actor B in the last one day and you looked only at Tom Cruise the model cannot just only recommend Tom Cruise's because you also liked in the recent past they found used using A B testing they found instead of using it as a sequence there, but if you take it as a set of inputs not as a sequence of inputs set of inputs then you can actually pick randomly some of those uh, behaviors and then do a run a query and then make recommendations in that. That was more successful because people felt more uh, liked more those recommendations than picking up only the last. Whereas, here they use the model where the user behavior was measured as a sequence of activities. So, if you this is the if you have the browsing history browsing history is where the user clicks on uh, is looking at certain URLs. They differentiate the word browsing versus session is if the user clicks on a URL which they recommended versus which is called session versus a, a URL the user clicked which was he came to the he or she came to the URL independently of the recommendation. So, a is the article. The article looked at by the user u at timestamp t minus 1 and timestamp t at timestamp t plus 1. At every timestamp, the recommendation model is actually recommending a bunch of articles for you. So, that is session for user at timestamp 1, recommended article 1, recommended article 2, recommended article 3, and so on to n and the user clicked one obviously you always click only one because if you click one and if you want to click something else you would actually move just your, your browsing history and then it goes to be t plus one. So, at any time stamp you would be clicking on one and s of u t 2 is what you have picked. The user state reflects your browsing history this is if you work in a news industry I think I want you to be really paying attention here. Your user state is a combination of all the browsing activities you have done, but more importance given to the recent browsing 
compared to the what you have done earlier. And this is a perfect scenario to use an RNN. RNN always takes it is a temporal data it actually takes the over a period of time. RNN is called recurrent neural networks and then LSTM and GRUs are variations of RNNs long short term memory. So, you have the browsing history that is encoded and send it in, into the LSTM. If you know LSTM you actually have an output gate an input gate a forget gate and then in the this lot of mathematical activity is happening you create a hidden state and from the hidden state you decode and you get the user embeddings. So, from each browsing history the browsing history at any timestamp for a user you can create the user embeddings and then you run the model to create you you you, you match uh, the articles and the users uh, using a dot product. That is how Yahoo News does for uh, in Japan markets. What is the time uh, we started? 6 30? Yeah, I will try to finish another 10 15 minutes. YouTube is another which is a, has a different scenario. Uh, time sensitivity is also important here, but people stick to popular and time sensitive uh, uh, videos but people also have shown their likes and dislikes over a period of time using their browsing history and then you can <coughs> you can run uh, the model. You have a bunch of videos millions of videos you actually identify a few candidate uh, videos run a model to rank them and then show the uh, ranking to you. So, this paper actually has two step approach they pick from the millions and millions of videos you pick a few I think maybe. 200 or 300 and then after that you rank them. For candidate generation and for ranking they use two different neural networks. The candidate generation model is here and ranking generation model is here the model is exactly almost the same uh, the way you do. Um, if you see at the top on and here too uh, while training you are doing a logistic uh, uh, loss training and while inference that is while, uh, while, while making recommendations or while serving you use a different method to, to recommend uh, to make it faster because in all of these situations whether it is a new situation or um, uh, the Google play situation or the YouTube the this the serving time is maybe a few tens or a few hundreds of milliseconds. Uh, in other words it is a sub second uh, response time. <coughs> to create the video embeddings all that it, they do is they take the video IDs of all the videos you have seen they average they in, they tried with technique or just summing up or averaging they found averaging seems to actually perform better. So, they average all the vectors the embedding vectors or the videos you have seen they also average the embeddings of your search queries when you do a YouTube and you actually search something each of the word you create a word embeddings for that and then you actually average all those search tokens uh, the, the, the embedding vectors are averaged for all the query you have done, search queries you have done, given and then you actually have other continuous and categorical categorical information all of this information is concatenated you can see the dot here is all concatenated horizontally and then you run through the model. And the same for once you generate a few candidate videos you have to rank them you actually have to give a score to them and the scoring is here logistic regression just it is logistic regression is always used for a continuous value you actually can give a score 1, 2, 3, 4 whatever is the scoring method you want to give it can it gives a score. Both the process has to happen in less than a second um, yeah that is that is that is what I think I can tell in the YouTube uh, how they are doing it. Now, the most exciting for me is this model by the way uh, all my slides they have lots and lots of information and um, I know it is against the basic presentation pr presentation fundamentals that you need to be keep it simple very simple presentation. It is I think it is difficult for me to explain a, sim a simple concept with not not putting too much of information there. Uh, um, we will have a video and we can share it, but yeah I guess so I think uh, yeah I think we will we will give the PDF files yes yeah. 
So this may look a little congested, but let me explain. Start, follow me. Let me explain first in what is an autoencoder. I think I mentioned to you earlier, you take just the raw data, put through a neural network, it creates a better data out of it. That's called autoencoder. But then came a newer concept called denoising autoencoder. They said instead of giving the right raw data and expect the model to create better and the right raw data, why do not we corrupt the data when we give it to the model and train the model to give us the better data. And that way when it is training, it can generalize better and you actually can get better data. That is called denoising. That is you introduce noise. So, in the regular encoder, S is the regular data. Uh, sorry, here the, regular, the, the input data is S and the final transform data is S and you do a loss function between the two when you are training. In the denoising, you, have, you want the final data S and you actually give a corrupted data and then you do a, a, a loss function on it. The next invention, the next step of evolution in autoencoders was, they said can we add additional information, in, 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 uh, additional information and not just only about the items and the products and that is called additional denoising autoencoder ADIE. In this paper, they use this as a basic building block and they said they are we are going to use the additional denoising. Let me explain it to you. So, you have the corrupted data that is coming in, it is a neural network, this is the weights and this is the uh, uh, middle layer and you have the hidden, hidden state here being computed and you have the additional information about the let us say the user or the item that is coming into the model and it computes the, uh, the predicted value for the data and the additional information. So, you giving the inputs and the model is outputting the same data, but better data and the inputs are your ratings and the additional information about the user or about the items and the model predicts better additional information about the user or the item and better rating data. That is called additional denoising autoencoder. They said instead of having just only one middle layer, we would be stacking the autoencoders with multiple encoders and that is what is additional stacked denoising autoencoder ASDAE. That is what it is and what they have taken this, this they have taken two of each of this, one for the uh, user information, one for the item information. So, this entire portion, the top portion is a additional stacked denoising encoder for only the user related information and this one is for item related information. So, in other words, they are actually sending the item corrupted item information and the item additional item information which is again corrupted and then the model is creating a better item information and a better it, uh, uh, additional information and the same thing for the user item user information and user it, uh, 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 additional information and taking this two information they are using a basic matrix factorization to arrive at the predictions. That is so, the, at the end of the whole paper, if you look into the, the, the new thing they are done is they are using additional stacked denoising autoencoders to make better R, remember the first slide I talked about R matrix, better R matrix, better X matrix, better Y matrix and then they are giving it to for matrix uh, uh, factorization to make a better predictions. That is what that is what about, but I think there are going to be more and more autoencoders that is going to be used to clean up the data, but to make a better prediction of better recommendation or better rating prediction of the uh, user item interaction. More techniques are yet to come. I have lots of other papers too, but that is all for today. If you have any questions, yes sir. Could be a cruise, could be a tour, 
hotel stays, durations. To your knowledge, has anyone tried it in the travel industry? I ask because I'm in the travel industry. I, I actually had a paper today, but I knew I will not have enough time. It's called point of interest. They're actually recommending point of interest. Uh, uh, um, yes, there are. There are people have already figured out. Well, people have implemented some solutions. They're they making progress. They are making good recommendations um, in terms of, like you said, whether it's a hotel or a cruise or an airplane or just a point of uh, interest or a, at a site you want to go see for sightseeing. They are people are using it, and that is not just only based on the user numbers or recommendations, but also including images posted. Um, actually, if you go to my, I have a YouTube channel, and then you can go check some of the videos I talked about a smart city implementation. One other example use case in a smart city implementation is if the city wants to find out something unusual happening on a specific road, let's say on an area, based on just the FaceTube, the Facebook videos posted by individuals. So, maintaining the privacy, if you and you and you and you are all on the same street but different locations, but let us say there is a fire, let us say there is an accident going on, we are independent taking pictures or images or videos and posting, the model can read and starts pointing on a, on a map about with a green light or a yellow light or a red light about what is happening there and the city can start action, acting. The same approach could be used in the in its point of interest recommendation, uh, looking at the images pictures, uh, the images, videos, text, feedback, uh, purchase, history. purchase history, yeah. And I ask because I, in, a, in a prior life, I made, when, when collaborative filtering was first, I guess, being introduced, you know, and learning from the, the rating of, you know, the whole, the whole user item matrix with, that was applied to books and movies, we, we attempted that in the travel space, but we couldn't decide what is the item. Mm -hmm. what, what is the item that we're trying to rate when you've got cruises of different durations, you've got the cruise brand, you've got the, the, the ground experience, you know, that thing that you're trying to rate was a stumbling block, the item. Got it, yeah. I, I don't know the answer, the but… The point of interest is a more abstract way to go at it, something where you can… Because obviously they solved that in the, the news, you know, the whole Yahoo News thing, that's a highly complicated item space. Yeah. yeah. And if they solved it there, then… I do not know the scenario, maybe we can sit offline and then talk, but I have heard of similar complications, but when I do, when I solve that problems, the, one of the first things I start asking questions is, show me your problem statement. Many times if the problem statement is not precisely defined, then comes the issue. The, I am sure you would have heard of this, a good problem statement is half the problem solved and I firmly believe in that. You. Go, so you may want to go back and look at the problem statement itself. What is it you're trying to solve? And uh, that may give a good starting point. Experiences or, you know, experience but in this case, you've got to be very, very specific. That's a good abstract legal vision, maybe. But if you want to make a problem statement, that has to be very, very precise. Yeah. Okay. yeah. okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you.